Hello, we're now looking at the 21st topic, the penultimate topic of this course, and we're following straight on from a previous video which is on networks, and now we're looking at the internet and the World Wide Web. So if we just look at the specification points, it uh, looks deceptively short, but there is a lot of lot of information to cover here. Uh, again, it's taken me ages, and uh, brace yourself for uh, the amount of information that's going to be coming. So I just thought, um, I've been showing you the specifications, I might as well show you any other information I found. This is just from an FAQ. LXL did, it's on the website, it's a public document and just uh, to clarify when it, when it talks about IP addressing you also need to know about two standards version 4 and version 6 and I've obviously included that and also uh, the fact that HTML and CSS are going to be assessed in the exam so don't be thinking that just because this is in here it's something to do with controlled assessment it's got nothing to do with controlled assessment, it's actually something you're going to get probably asked in the exam and I'm going to explain this a little bit later Okay, so to begin, uh, the internet, as we maybe touched on in a previous video, um, is basically just a worldwide collection of networks that uses the uh, internet protocol suite we looked at in the last video, TCP IP, and uh, the internet is an example of a wide area network. Uh, but despite this, um, the internet is maintained and constructed by organisations called internet service providers. And these are, as I say, large organisations that provide services in order to uh, facilitate access and use of the internet. And they basically form a hierarchy. So it looks a bit like this. I've got a couple of these diagrams in this video from uh, Computer Science and Overview, which is a very good textbook. Um, and so we, we have a hierarchy. And at the top, we have Tier 1 ISPs. And so these are a few. There's not exactly many of them, maybe 10 in the world. Uh, very large, very fast and high capacity international networks. And these are operated by the huge communications companies. Most of them are American. I think Orange might class as a tier one ISP, which is a French company. Vodafone are up there. Vodafone might be considered a tier two ISP, which is similar, but just a little bit smaller, maybe more regional. Uh, so one thing that's important is uh, these are four of as the connecting backbone of the internet. So these are the guys that operate the uh, you know the uh, cables. Um, that you know go underseas and link continents. There are people that um, with their communication companies have satellites and so on. Uh, they really have the hardware that forms this connecting backbone of the internet that all of us connect to. And um, so tier two ISPs. I mean, it's kind of subject subjective. You can't say definitively uh, Vodafone is a tier one ISP. It's a little bit subjective. They're not exactly going to say they are. It's not like a league system. It just is a way of thinking about it. And then you have the access I ISPs, which are maybe the smaller ones. Maybe the ones you actually have the network. You the actual. Uh, people you actually pay every month um, that just provide the internet access to the individual users. And at the end we have um, end systems, so like the hosts, which are computers, basically just us. Um, so just to follow on a little bit, um, really these tier 1 and tier 2 ISPs are really just collect uh, networks of routers that provide the infrastructure of the internet, this backbone. Um, and routers are special purpose computers that are used for forwarding packets. Their purpose is to forward packets. And so the way they work is each router maintains a forwarding table which contains information about the surrounding networks. So really they form bridges between networks and also they contain information about where packets should be sent based on their destination address, so their, their IP address. So a home router that sits in a corner in your house looks a bit like this. It might, if it's a wireless one it will have the uh, antennae uh, and it simply just connects the user to the ISP whereas a more powerful call router this is sort of one maybe used in a business it's not a call router necessarily but it's clearly uh, more powerful than this little home router and this forward pack is on the backbone itself so the ISPs will have potentially loads of massive powerful routers that actually are going to be forwarding packets across these intercon intercontinental uh, wires and cables um, and so the router uses the destination IP address to identify where to send the packet and routing algorithms identify the best route to get there. We talked about packet switching, the idea that packets can take different routes to get to the destination, well uh, different routers can send them in different directions but they're always going to end up at the destination device. So an IP address uniquely identifies a device on a network and defines where it's located geographically. geographically. If that's something a MAC address doesn't do um, you can have two IP addresses, one locally to the network and one when you're connected to the internet you have uh, you could have two IP addresses but basically they identify you uniquely on a network um, and uh, it's much more geograph 
geographically, if I can say it, linked. And uh, this is the two versions I was talking about. Um, two versions of IP addresses in active use. Version 4, IPv4, and version 6, IPv6. And so this is what a typical IPv4 version 4 address looks like. And it uses something called dotted decimal notation. I'm not really going to overly explain because there's no indication you need to know it. But this is how IP addresses are usually uh, formatted. Um, if you pause it, you can probably work out what's going on, but I don't want to... Uh, make it overly confusing. Just to talk about this a little bit more, so the version 4 addresses a 32-bit number, so this means it can address 2 to the power 32 hosts uniquely, uh, and this is 4 billion and whatever. Uh, whereas IPv version 6 addresses are 128-bit numbers, and this means it can address 2, 2 to the power 128 hosts uniquely, and this is an enormous number, so this is this number. I had to use a special calculator to a special web calculator to get this number. You can't just type it into a normal calculator because it's too too big. Um, but we'll get rid of this because it hurts your eyes. This is like billion, billion, billion or something along those lines. Uh, so why would they do this? Why are there two sets? Why could in, why in version four our IP address is 32 bits and in, in version six why are they 128 bits? Well, as the internet grew at such a rate, IPv version four was finally exhausted in 2011. So this is the version four. The fact that this version 4 was a bit misleading, I don't know what the first three versions were, um, but this is pretty much what was just used on the internet. Um, but the internet kind of blew up, uh, to use that term, um, and so it, it was finally in 2011, they kind of predicted it in the 1990s, or they probably predicted it straight away to be honest. Um, but finally, uh, the pool available, so uh, the, an internet service provider by, I guess, another organising agency, provide a ISP with a set of IP addresses they can assign their customers and eventually this pool uh, ran out effectively they need to identify the host uniquely because this is like a destination address and they ran out so we had to use a bigger address which can um, address many more hosts uniquely so basically they ran out of space and so uh, IPv version 6 is a large capacity address just something slightly different to change the topic slightly. Uh, I just saw this on a mark scheme and I thought you might as well uh, just explain it. So you can have a static IP address and if you have a static IP address it means it's not, it doesn't change once it's assigned. Whereas a dynamic IP address is assigned whenever you connect to a network so it can change. So a MAC address can never change whereas an IP address as long as it's dynamic can change and it changes when it's assigned when you connect to a network. So another point, uh, these aren't connected points, uh, IP addresses are not ideal for human use. So as we saw um, the dotted decimal notation briefly, I showed you um, that's in decimal, um, whereas of course it'd be in binary, 128 bits if it's IPv version 6. And so they're not ideal for human use. If you wanted to go to youtube.com, you wouldn't want to um, type in a 128-bit number or even a decimal uh, IP address. That just wouldn't be ideal. And it brands would really struggle to have websites. And by the way, um, version 6 um, of this internet protocol address, by, yeah, I'm not sure I said IP stands for internet protocol, uh, we kind of touched on it in a previous video, um, but they're, they're rolling out IP, IPv version 6, um, it's probably um, almost, your, your IP address is probably a version 6 one by now. Anyway, uh, so as I say, IP addresses can be mapped to domain names. We kind of said what a domain name was before, but this would be a domain name as the exam board define it. So the host, this is our host name, and this is just for host server. So www means it indicates you're connecting to the host server. You don't always need to type this in. So if you typed youtube.com into your browser, you'd get to youtube.com. You wouldn't have to type www um, because often it's configured to go to the host server by default. Whereas a domain name, in a technical sense, is just connecting to the network, um, but it's often configured just to go straight to the host server that displays the web page. So this suffix .com or .co.uk or .net uh, reflects the classification of the domain. So YouTube is a commercial organisation, hence .com, um, and then you have .co, which is um, a company, and then .uk is um, our country code, and uh, other ones have different meanings too. So really, the host name. Um, is the individual device and the domain name is the location of a resource on the internet. So we're now talking about the internet, not just general networks. The next thing I want to cover is two network models. To uh, well, we, so far we've classified networks in terms of their geographical scale and also their arrangement, so like the topology. The two we're looking at on this 
page, client server, and peer to peer. They're more about how the networks behave or how the nodes behave. So, on a client server network, every computer system, every node on the network has the role of either being a client or a server. So, there's two definitions a server is a provider of a service or resource, and a client is a requester of a service from a server. So, two definitions that kind of need to be used in tandem. Not brilliant definitions, I don't know how I should define them, um, but we're going to be using these two terms quite a bit. So, in a client server network, as you'd assume, uh, they're either going to be a client or a server. So the way it works is the client establishes a connection with the server over whatever network it is, so it could be a LAN, it could be a WAN. Uh, in terms of a wide area network, like the internet, uh, when you connect to the internet, the client is usually a web browser, and so when you access a website, the site server provides a resource, which will be the web page content in HTML. And so this is kind of a diagram we give it. So the reason the computer system is connected to the central server, and they all establish a connection with the server. So the main advantage to this, in a LAN at least, is that the server can back up and store data centrally, um, although they can be expensive and uh, difficult to run. Uh, the second uh, network model is peer-to-peer, -peer, and so this has no central server, and so it looks a bit more like this, a bit more like our mesh topology, although we're talking about sort of a behaviour of a network in this classification. So in this, uh, each computer is equal in responsibility as opposed to in the client server network where servers have more responsibility than the clients. Um, whereas uh, here each computer has the ability to work as both a client and a server, it can uh, it switches. So some internet services do use this technology like uh, Bitcoin and BitTorrent, um, but really it's establishing direct connections with the computers themselves which is why it's called peer-to-peer -peer rather than client server. Okay, we're now going to look at how the domain name can be translated to the IP address. And there is a reason why we uh, covered the client server a bit just now. So domain name system, DNS, translate a non translates a non-user friendly IP address to its domain name. So I said that, um, well, it's, it's more vice versa, it's more the opposite way around, to be honest. So I said before that you could type an IP address into a web browser and it would connect to that computer. So this was one of the servers for Google. I think it's changed now. I tried it a couple of days ago, it didn't seem to work. Um, but this was one of the servers' uh, IPs for Google. So this, when I type this in, I'd go to the Google homepage. Um, but when I want to type this in, that's I have to look that up, firstly, using Google, ironically. Um, but uh, this is much easier, much more user-friendly. This is our domain name. So typing this in, um, first of all, would you'd connect to a domain name system server, sometimes just called domain name server, also written as DNS, so it gets a little bit confusing. I want to stick to calling it a domain name system server. So it connects to this server, and the server sends back the IP address and it connects to Google like this. We don't necessarily see uh, the actual IP address. But um, we'll, talk about, we'll expand this a little bit. So what DNS server is, is a server that contains a database of IP addresses and the corresponding domain name. So there are loads of DNS servers of different scales. Again, there's a bit of a hierarchy in terms of this. Someone setting up a website could create their own or could have their own domain name server, but um, ISPs tend to handle this. You tend to pay them to handle this and they'll store your domain name and the IP address in their server. So we operate in a client server network, which we can demonstrate here, and maybe emphasizes what we just looked at. So first of all, the user requests a website, so in this example, Google. We then connect to a DNS server, and the DNS server kind of asks itself a question. First of all, is this IP address in the DNS server database? If it's not, it basically connects to another DNS server database. So the DNS server then acts as a client connecting to another uh, server and it kind of repeats this until it finds the IP address for this domain name uh, because not all the uh, DNS servers will have every domain name um, until it kind of gives up I suppose. But if it is in the DNS server or until it finds a server that has this uh, name and the IP address it can then um, contact uh, the domain servers via the routers because this is sent back essentially to the browser, the browser is now the client again and uh, we can connect to the actual web server which will have Google on it or the Google web pages. So just to uh, go over this again quickly, so I've labelled it 1, 2 and 3. Uh, so the web browser acts as a client and connects to the DNS server to check whether the domain name is in its database. It then checks for the domain name's IP address in its database. If it doesn't have it, it keeps asking again until other DNS server finds it and then when the DNS server has the IP address, the user can then connect to the domain web server. 
a uh, bit wordy, but uh, hopefully that gets the message across. Right, so we're not looking for World Wide Web, or just for web, and this is a portion of the internet. So maybe a misconception of people who don't really know much about this, I mean, there's no reason why they uh, should necessarily, um, is maybe that the internet is the World Wide Web, whereas the internet is really uh, the hardware, so for cables, for routers, and the World Wide Web is the actual information stored on the hardware, so stored on the servers. So the World Wide Web is uh, consists of billions of linked web pages written in HTML, which stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and stored on these different web servers. But this is so this is a more standard, probably better better way to think about it. But the first the first way that I thought about it, and it kind of stuck for me, was to think of like the internet as kind of this big green circle. I mean, part of it is the World Wide Web, part of it is email, part of it is sort of file transfers, peer-to-peer -peer maybe, um, and other bits too. So I almost think of the World Wide Web as being a section of the internet, or at least it uses the internet hardware. So you would have heard of URL. Uh, you might not know what it stands for. It stands for Uniform Resource Locator. And this is a full address used to locate and retrieve a web page. This is what you type into the address bar in your web browser. So this could be an example uh, URL if you sort of write everything out correctly. Uh, the web browser kind of um, is coded so that it can deal with you not writing everything out perfectly, or at least the first bit. So the first bit uh, is the protocol. Uh, this is hypertext transfer protocol. So it indicates the protocol being used. It could be uh, with S at the end, but we're just gonna wait a second to talk about that. So this is the protocol being used to retrieve the document here. So this is the actual document name, index.html. It's a HTML file, and this is our domain name we looked at. So we're talking about this protocol, HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, as I said, and this is the rules governing how documents are transferred between the browsers and the web servers, and it's assumed to be used even if you don't actually fully write it out. Uh, HTTPS, you would have noticed this probably on certain websites, is the extension of this, so it's, it's HTTP with um, added security, basically. And it's often used in situations automatically when personal information is being exchanged, like online banking, signing into your YouTube account or your Facebook or whatever. And it makes use of other protocols for encrypt the data, so it's using other protocols and other bits of code too. Um, and it will take more steps than HTTP as uh, to check, basically. Uh, so it will make sure the web server is authentic and someone is actually the client too. The client for web browser might be the easier thing to gain access to, so it will take more steps, probably take longer, um, but it has added security. So HTML, this stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and so Hypertext forms a basis of simple web pages. It's just a document that links to other documents through hyperlinks, so these are the links you click on to go to another web page. This is the linked web pages kind of idea. So now, um, because the media is no longer just text, as the internet's evolved, it's not just a textual web page, fortunately, uh, sometimes hypermedia is used instead, so you might see this term. So HTML is the language used to create a web page. It's not a programming language. A programming language sort of does something. This is just a markup language which sort of des describes the presentation of the web page. So I'm not going to um, teach you how to do HTML because really I'm competent in HTML. I've never been that into designing web pages. Some people do it from quite a young age and re really enjoy designing web pages. It's never really been my thing. And I'm competent at HTML and CSS, but I'm not really good enough to feel confident enough teaching you. So um, there'll be two links in the description to a 15 minute, around about 15 minute tutorial on each of this from someone else who probably knows more than me. Um, and you do need to potentially do this in the exam. Um, so make sure you get somewhat comfortable. Um, uh, the way HTML works is web browsers read and interpret the code to present to the user view. So I just did this now, uh, just in Notepad, so you can practice this in Notepad. I'd recommend, if you're sort of revising last minute, I'd recommend you watch your videos. They're not that long, with 15 minutes. I mean, plus if I, if I did this in this video, it would add sort of half an hour onto it, and it's probably going to be long enough as it is. So hopefully you can understand me not wanting to uh, teach you from scratch. Um, so uh, really the key bit is that HTML uses tags, and so web browsers will interpret these tags, so uh, HTML, this tag encompasses, and you have to close it too, of the main body of text here, um, and uh, H1 is uh, the class of heading, the most important heading, um, so it looks like this, a very boring, a very simple web page. I imagine in questions you're most likely to have to be able to interpret this rather than write it, but you should probably be prepared to write it too. But hopefully the tutorials I'll link you in the description and any other ones you need to use will uh, get you more comfortable. But like I say, you can just practice in Notepad, you don't have to download anything spe special. Um, 
and you can just run it in your web browser. Um, so the main difference between a normal text document and a hypertext document is these tags, as I mentioned, uh, which describe how the document should be displayed and what other images, um, what other resources need to be attached and which items are hyperlinks. So hopefully those videos will cover that. I have watched both of them just to make sure they're good enough and uh, I think they'll be quite useful. So another thing which I just mentioned, CSS, this stands for Cascading Style Sheets. And so this is used in addition to HTML to, to further describe the presentation. And it basically makes the web page look a lot more attractive. You get much more uh, nice looking web pages. HTML is relatively simple and CSS is kind of, I think of it as an extension. That's probably not a web developer, that's probably not how a web developer would describe it, but uh, I'm not nearly as specialized to do that. So CSS is basically just a way of formatting the HTML document outside of the HTML code. So when I've done this, um, I store, I have a separate CSS file stored and a separate HTML document stored, or file stored, and uh, they're very much separate. You can actually use CSS within HTML code, but it's more, it's just kind of recommended that you split it up for reasons we'll look at in a second. So this, HT, this CSS code is basically what it's doing here is it's setting all h3 heading this is the tag to these properties outside of the html code so this would be in a separate file to uh, the actual html code so the actual place where a h3 is being defined in html is different to um, this uh, file so what we're doing here we're kind of changing the font we have some backup fonts here um, things like the spacing and where the margins are and the color it's quite important and um, Yes, not really much more I can add. So this just means that you leave the HTML code. So if you just want to change the design, all you have to change is the CSS file uh, instead of the actual HTML code. Um, so this is uh, quite a cool website I found. Um, it's called cssengarden.com. And basically this uses the same HTML code, but different CSS files. And you can load up different CSS files and you can see how drastic the website's changed. The, the HTML content is the same, but the actual designs change a lot based on CSS. So the final thing to kind of talk about is the fact that things can happen both client side and server side. And as we've said previously, usually in this context, the client is the web browser, which acts on behalf of the user. So the user gains access through the websites, uh, sorry, gains access to the websites through the browser stored on the user's computer. So just to recap kind of what we've looked at so far, if we can get it into paragraphs. So when we load a web page, a request is made to the domain name server, the DNS server, which translates the URL into an IP address. This is then used to contact the web server through the, uh, by the web browser, and the host then serves the web page to the browser, which is interpreted. This is in HTML and then is displayed on the user's computer. So some processing can be done client side, such as by the browser, and some can be done server side by the uh, web server. So on the client side, uh, I mean, on the server side, the following things happen. So on the client side, the interactive web pages are made. So um, things can happen more dynamically on the client side because it can happen more in real time. Uh, things like uh, cookies, which we'll look at in a second, can be interacted with as well as local storage, which is similar to cookies but slightly, slightly different, you don't have to know about it, I don't think. Also programming um, on the client side can be done using things like JavaScript and HTML and CSS, although they're not really programming languages. Whereas on the server side, permanent storage can be accessed, so the actual databases that the server is using. Um, as opposed to it can't really be done on the client side. Also user input can be processed um, and programming languages for server side basically every programming language we can just interact with connections. We often uh, use a term script in this context and I just wanted to cover it just in case it comes up. I doubt it will but you never know. So a script um, is just a set of commands that can be executed without any user interaction so often you'll hear server side scripts. So just to look at some advantages and disadvantages of why you might want to uh, process on the client side. Well, first of all, it reduces the workload of the server. So any processing done by the client is processing that doesn't need to be done by the server. And if it's quite a busy server, like if you're running a website with only one server, then the workload uh, can be quite well can be reduced for more you for more uh, workload you put on the client, and so it can potentially speed up the server. And also it allows for more instant responses. So if inputs can be validated by the client or processed by the client, then it saves this connection to the server. And we've looked at all those kind of connections from back and forth that need to um, be done to connect to the server. So it reduces this and so the overall web traffic, so the channels for transmission mediums are going to be uh, less busy. So advantages of server-side processing, well servers are usually very powerful, usually more powerful than 
client computers and so processing is usually faster server side also no software plugins need to be installed on the user's computer to run something like javascript um, you need to have sort of a plugin and it saves as being installed if everything can be done and made server side then it makes it easier for the client and also any patches or updates only need to be applied to the server so if you uh, had to if you wanted to change something uh, on your website you don't have to apply it server side if the servers were making the websites and then sending them back to the user if, it, if it's some of it's done on the client side any changes have to be actually applied to the client so I said we would talk about a cookie so a web cookie you've probably heard of this because uh, it's been in the news recently um, it's just a small piece of data synced from a web server and stored in the user's web browser while the user is browsing so whenever the browser then requests a page from the server the data is sent back so this cookie is um, stored on, on your browser and whenever you go back to the website again uh, in a different session uh, the data can be sent back to the, to the server and it can do some interaction with that and it can be used to identify users so you can tell you're signed in and also prepare customized web pages for them so for example like a shopping basket when you uh, shopping something say on Amazon and you close if you close the window and come back to it later, uh, your ba your basket's still there. That's because the server has stored that and told the server again. This is what you've probably heard of because you see messages on every website you go to. So tracking cookies are cookies with store details of individuals browsing histories. And often this data is used by advertisers to serve relevant adverts. So you'll be shopping for something, go on another website, and magically uh, you'll have an advert of the same thing you just looked at. And this is used by advertisers, obviously, it's be beneficial for them. And so, this is why in the EU, websites now have to ask for your consent. You know, you have those messages saying that, you know, by using the website, you accept to using cookies. And so, this is what uh, that means. So, that's it for this topic. A lot of information again. If you are confused by anything, um, you might want to go back and watch it or try and find other videos on it because it's good to sometimes use as much information coming from different sources for things like this. Um, so yeah, hopefully it was useful. Next up we're looking at an another really important topic, it's the last topic in the course, but it'd be very tempting to skip it, but actually there's a lot of information to cover in it too.